I'm so excited because today we have a very special guest speaker in the house. Um, I'm going to say some words about him, but he is none other than Pastor Shane Johnston, all the way from Coquitlam, BC, which is basically Vancouver. We're so excited to have him. Roberto and I were driving to pick him up from his hotel this morning, and we realized that it was pretty much exactly three years ago that we went to Vancouver with our church planting family, Arc Canada, and that's where we met Pastor Shane. Um, and it was crazy because never met this guy before, and we're sitting at this round table. We're talking about strategic ministry paradigms and dynamics, and how are you gonna run service? And I'm like, I think I'm pretty good at this stuff, so I'm just telling him we're gonna do this and this and this. And he looks at me and he just like tells me something along the lines of, I don't remember exactly the wording, but it was like, you're a son of God. You're worthy. You're good at all this stuff. It doesn't matter. Your heart matters. Who you are matters. And you're his son. And from then on began a beautiful relationship. We've connected uh, with him. So they're the one, him and his wife, Rachel, by the way, they pastor Resonate Church in BC, but they have been a lifeline to Robert and I over the last three years. And over the last three years, you know, we bring in as many guest speakers as we can, friends, people we have relationship with, and every single one of them has had some kind of significant impact in our lives. All of them shepherd us and, and pastor us, but Pastor Shane and Pastor Rachel are our pastors. They are our leaders, and we are just so eternally grateful for them and that he's here today. And I just know that the word he shares is gonna bless you and impact your life. It's gonna challenge you. Get ready to just feel a lot of stuff, to be challenged and encouraged and walk out of here feeling like, man, God is for me, he is with me, and I could conquer the world. It's gonna be so good. And so whenever we have a guest speaker in the house, we cheer. We honor the men and women of, that God sends to us to share from the word of God. And so um, we're gonna do that uh, in just a moment. We're gonna clap, we're gonna cheer. We're gonna really make him feel welcomed here at Rose Church. So I'm gonna stop talking so he can come up and talk. So let's put our hands together. Let's lift up our voices as we welcome Pastor Shane Johnston. Oh, so good to be with you today. You can go ahead and grab a seat. I love this. Man, I hope you know that this is special, what God is doing in this room as I look around and I just see the culture of worship. Thank you guys. Thank you, worship team. Come on, give it up for these guys. It's a great, great team. I see some friends in the room today, people that I know. And so I, I just, it's, it's family. It's good to be with family. I want to take a moment at the start and I want to honor your pastors. I'm so thankful that God has put our lives together. As Pastor Mark said, it was February, the end of February, 2020. And so I've blocked out every single memory I can of 2020, except for that I met you. Um, and I do remember sitting at that table and what we're experiencing today in the room was just a dream in their hearts. And they were sharing about it and they could see it. And I love that about your pastors, that they are visionaries, that they're dreamers, that God has given them a beautiful vision for your church of seeing your hearts discipled in Jesus. That's what this is about. We're not here to play church. We're not here to just have a van. We're not just here to hear a speaker. No, we're here to have our hearts just rended by God, opened by God and led on a journey so that we can look more and more like Jesus. And so I'm thankful that that's the vision that's in their hearts. I also just want to honor them because they are leaders that they just, they live the call of God that they speak over you. So every single month we're in a small group together. My wife Rachel and I lead small groups for pastors in Canada and we're part of these great groups and they're there every single month investing in other leaders, being vulnerable with their own hearts. And so they don't just ask you to be in a group and in Jesus community. No, they actually do it themselves. And so come on, can you get up for your pastors today? Thank God for them. And they brag about you. We're, we're, Yesterday we went, I don't know where you took me last night, we took me to the Forks and there was people, there was people skating out 
outdoors and you told me we were walking on, a, is that like a river or something? I, like is, do you understand this doesn't compute with my mind? Like you're not supposed to walk on rivers. Like you guys can walk on the water in Winnipeg. And so we're walking on the water last night, and he's just bragging about people from Rose Church. He's telling me about how Christmas happened, and then you had to go back in on the break, and a few people just, like, were able to show up. There was, you are talking about um, Colin, I think Colin Smith, is that right? Matt Fabry, is that right? And then Marlene showed up to Elim Church, or Elim, or whatever it's called, and tore down all this stuff. And they're just bragging on, like just boasting on what Jesus is doing. So come on, one more time. Come on, give it up for your church, your pastors. I believe uh, that God put a word in my heart for you today. And it's a significant word. Uh, I woke up this morning early, was praying for you, was praying into this message, even felt God sort of change course for me a little bit this morning on what I would share and how I would focus on our time together. So I believe this is a significant word. I want to bring a message to you today called Dream Again. Dream Again. And I think this is significant because every one of us have had a dream at some point in our lives. We've had a picture of what the future could look like. And what can happen is you go through tough seasons and the dream can begin to feel dormant or delayed. You face disappointments and the dream can get put on a shelf. Today, I wanted to come and challenge us from God's word. It's actually God's desire to place a dream back inside your heart. Go with me in the scripture to Joel chapter 2. You might know this verse. It says, then after doing all those things, God's making a promise to some dreamers. He says, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon Rose Church, upon all people, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your old men are going to dream some dreams. And what that is saying to us is that some people who feel like their time is past, that it's too late for them, that I've missed my moment, God's going to show up and remind you, no, I've still got a dream for you. I believe God wants to stir up a dream in our hearts today. Our kids right now at home, so I'm married, my wife Rachel and I, my wife is, I wish she was here with us. She is such a gift. We co-pastor, lead pastor together. We started our church five years ago, so just a couple years ahead of you at Rose Church. And I, I even remember when I was there leading that intensive for you guys in Vancouver at the time. And I'm like, man, we're just two years in and I'm just pretending like we had it all together. Like, just listen to me. If you do these few things, it will work out. And I, trust me, we were two years in. So I was like, I don't even know if this works out. But you know, we were teaching them the little that we knew at the time. And God has, of course, blessed our church. We're so thankful for what Jesus has done. So there's Rach and I, we, we are co-lead pastors, but my wife is also a therapist, runs a business, and then we are parents to three kids. We've got eight, six, and four going on. We have two girls, Avia and Alencia, and then we've got our wild little guy. His name is Wylan, he's four years old. And so our kids right now, they're dreaming, they're dreaming about Disney World. It was the big, I mean, you know what I'm saying? How many, how many your parents took you to Disneyland or Disney World? Let me see the spoiled kids, let me see. I'm still giving my parents a hard time. Like I had to take myself to Disney World as an adult. There's healing for those wounds. We got a different message for that. Our kids are, I'm like, I'm not going to wait. My kids are going to get to Disney World before they're adults and have to pay for themselves. So in in, end of February and into March, we're taking a ministry trip down to Florida to uh, see our pastors. And and so as we're going, we're taking our kids, we're going to take them to Disney World. And so right now our kids are dreaming about Disney World all the time. They wake up in the morning, they want to watch the YouTube clips of the ride along rides so they can go and see what it's going to look like on the ride. And it was just this week, my little guy, Wylan, again, he just turned four. He came up to me. This is the cutest thing. He comes up to me with a notebook, and he said, Dad, can we take this notebook to Florida so that Mickey can sign his autograph in it? My dude is planning ahead. My kids are having some Disney World dreams, and I tell you that just to stir up inside of you that you have a God in heaven that actually wants you to be dreaming a God dream. He wants you to have a vision for the future that is led by him, that you wake up excited about, that you believe that the future is bright in your life. I believe God wants to stir up a God dream. So for the next few minutes, I want to talk about three things. First of all, 
why it's so important that we dream God dreams. Secondly, how do I get a God dream? What would I even do to have a God dream? And then finally, I want to talk about how do I, at the end, test this dream's actually from God. Are you with me? Come on, Rose Church, are you with me? So let's talk about why it's so important that we dream God dreams. In Psalm 126, it says this. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, so when God's people had been through some stuff that was difficult, and God came and restored their fortunes, brought them back. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, kind of sounds like a season that we're in right now. Like you were saying, 2023 is a year. We believe for our church, we're saying this, it's a year of delight. Come on, just like rather than like head down, shoulders hunched, we're stepping into 23, like a year of delight in our church. So when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. And in the footnote of a lot of Bibles, you'll see this, and we've got it there under the text. It can also be translated, we were like those restored to health. So notice, this is so significant that the same words that get translated dream in the Old Testament can be translated restored to health. There's an interchangeability of this idea of dreams and health. And what scripture is wanting us to see is that part of the way God brings you back to life, part of the way he puts energy back into your step, faith for your future, is that he gives you a dream, a part of your health and your well-being is connected to dreaming a God dream. So let me tell you a little bit of of my story because I know what it's like to have a dream go dormant and die and think I've been through too many disappointments to see that dream come to pass. So my career started, I started as a musician, worked on some cruise ships for a bit, then transitioned into business world, went and became a chartered accountant. Where am I, where are my loud accountants at? Come on, let me hear. It's like never, you ask that and it's just dead silent. It's like, I don't want to say it. I'm with you, chartered accountant. So I was becoming a chartered accountant and God put a call to ministry on my life and on my wife's heart. And we didn't see Resonate Church. We didn't have in mind that we'd be pastors of a church. That wasn't it at all. All we really wanted to do was do life with people that were far from Jesus and see them discover his goodness. That was really the simplicity of the dream. So God puts this dream on our heart while I'm in business. And so Rach and I, as we prayed it out and said, okay, God, what does that look like? We felt like God said that I was to quit my job and for two years go and volunteer full-time in our church, which sounds like a crazy thing. I even had Christian chartered accountants in our church being like, you're committing career suicide, don't do it. You'll never get back the time that you lose. And I said, well, this is what God put in our hearts. And as I was getting ready to go and do this, to quit my job and go volunteer at my church, everything went sideways. I ended up developing carpal tunnel syndrome in both my hands. Again, the accountant kind of work. We're doing like work forever was the vibe, work and study. And I was trying so hard to be a good husband and make lots of money and do all that thing, the early career grind. And I see some young phases, Rose Church, you know what I mean? So I love that it's multi-generational. But I see some of y'all, you're in that early career grind. You know what I'm saying? You're working your face off. I was working my face off and my hands went numb from overuse. To the point where even for a season, for a couple of years, I couldn't wear long sleeve shirts. There was so much nerve pain in my wrists. I couldn't even cut my own food at dinner time. Like imagine as a young married man, you're like, babe, could you cut my food for me? I felt completely, everything had been robbed from my life. And so I'm thinking now I can't quit my job. In fact, the firm that I worked for, they hired a guy to type for me and to go to clients. Like he would turn pages for me. My hands were that numb from overuse. And so I thought, well, there's no way now I can quit my job and go volunteer at my church because imagine trying to show up to another employer in the future and be like, you've got to hire me and somebody else to turn pages for me. I'm like, I'm never going to get a job again. I've got to stay here. And this is what I'm telling to my wife. I'm saying, babe, I can't quit anymore. If I leave this job, I'll never get hired again. And my wife, we were living in a 400 square foot apartment. We took the doors down from the rooms because it was like, this is too small to even have doors between rooms. We're just in this tiny little space. And my wife looked at me and she said, is God calling us to this or not? I was like, okay, there, radical woman of faith. I guess we'll do what God put in our hearts to do. So I went into my boss's office to quit my job. Now, before I even went in there, there was one other detail, one more thing that we did. Rach and I, we had $30,000 of student debt We had $3,000 in the bank. Everything that we had was that $3,000. And we felt like God spoke to us and said, go quit your job, but also give away everything you have. 
Now, I'm not telling you, Rose Church, that today you need to give away everything you have before you leave here. I would not recommend it unless you hear God tell you to do it. But we knew God had told us to do it. And so we wrote a check for everything that we had to our church before I went in and resigned from my job, y'all. Like, it's kind of, it's crazy faith, but God had put it in our hearts. So I walk in. My boss, his name was Peter. He was the managing partner of this accounting firm. And I'm sitting down on the other side of his desk and I'm quitting my job. I'm saying, Peter, I'm going to volunteer at my church full time for the next two years. And I just see this look of this, this man who's not a Christian, doesn't believe in God. And he just looks at me like I'm utterly insane. Like, what are you doing? Why would you? He's just in shock. And he had no forewarning. He didn't know I was coming to quit my job that day. And he sits on the other side of his desk and he looks across and he says this to me. He says, okay, I want to keep paying you. Like he didn't consult with the other partners. I'm like, how is this going to be? I was like, okay. And before I could say thank you to him, I got this little kind of check in my heart. And I thought, maybe he's doing this because even though I'm like, one employee for the price of two, I'm a good employee and he wants me to come back someday and he's just trying to keep me tied to the organization. And so I said to him, well, that's so generous. I'd love to receive that, but I don't think I can receive it in good faith because I don't think I'm ever coming back. And he looks across again, across his big managing partner desk and, and he says to me, no, I just wanna keep paying you. And so when I quit my job to go volunteer at our church, every two weeks I would get paid my full paycheck as a chartered accountant. Now, maybe you're thinking they just forgot that I was on the payroll and it kept going and no one was aware that this was going on. And at the end of every month, true story, Rachel isn't here to attest to this, but true story, I would phone up Peter at the end of every month and I would say, hey, thanks for paying me twice more. I know I didn't show up to work at all. I just wanted you to know that if you're doing this to get me to come back, I, I, I think I'm less likely to come back than ever. And he would just say, okay, we'll just keep it going for another month and then another month and then another month. Now, one more part to the story of the miracle that God did. At the same time as they were paying me to not show up, the economy went into a downturn and they laid off a guy who had the same job that I was getting paid to not do. So the guy who was showing up and actually working got laid off because of the firm's finances while they were paying me to not show up. And I share that story to say, it might seem like you're in a season where the dream is delayed or the dream is dormant, but I wanna encourage you that part of the reason God gives you a dream is to revive you, is to give you a hope-filled expectation for your future. We serve a God who, if you will surrender to his lordship and his leadership, will lead you with miracles. Come on, it is those who surrender wholeheartedly, your kingdom come, your will be done, that find themselves in the middle of a move of God. Come on, Rose Church, is that what we want in 2023? Why do we need a God dream? Because dreams, dreams revive us. But how many know it's easy to get into that low expectations place where I don't know if I can take that step of faith? As I said, my wife is a therapist, so she, she's the smart one of us. She will let me know about some studies. and So she let me know about this one relating to expectations. And what the study shows is that actually for a time and for a season, people with low expectations can find themselves moderately more happy. Hold on a minute. Why? For a short season, would someone who has lowered expectations find themselves more happy? You think about the season that we've all been through over the past number of years. In that kind of season, it actually makes sense in the short term to lower some expectations. I don't know, you know, for us at Resonate Church, we, we kind of, after, uh, after God just got a hold of us at Resonate Church, and I see some friends who've been to Resonate Church in the past, God just, the, the church took off. We were seeing miracle, radical growth. But well, we go through a season the past few years where we're not seeing those things, and all of a sudden you're like, well, but my expectations, do I need to lower them for a moment? But watch this. In the short run, those with lowered expectations might find themselves moderately more happy. But in the long run, 
People who have uh, fulfilled expectations, people who live great lives of influence for Jesus' church are those with massive expectations. You see, for the short run, it might have made sense to lower expectations, but the problem is if we live that way in the long run, we miss all the mountaintops. And I believe God sent me here today, Rose Church, to call you to get your expectations back up to call you to begin to dream again, to have that God-inspired, faith-filled vision of your future. And I know I'm talking to some people today who feel like that's not for me. Maybe that's for pastors like Mark and Roberta. Maybe that's for you, Pastor Shane. No, I'm talking to, I'm talking to everybody in the room to get our faith up because God wants to give you a dream that will revive. That's the first thing. Why do I need a God dream? So the second question then becomes, well, how do I actually get a God dream? Isn't a dream something that just sort of happens or doesn't happen? Like what impact could I play in the process? How do I actually get a God dream? I believe there's something we can do. We're going to go in the Old Testament to Genesis chapter 28. It's one of the most well-known dream stories in the Bible about a young man by the name of Jacob. We're going to study the context of the dream in just a few minutes. But before we study the dream itself, I want to see what Jacob did before the dream in order to get the dream. Are you with me? What is the thing that happened before Jacob received the dream? Genesis chapter 28. Jacob is having a father-son conversation with his dad, Isaac. It's the same like Wyland and I, we have father-son conversations right now. They're a little bit. They're a little bit younger type conversations, like he just turned four. And so our father-son conversations sound like, Wylan, I know mommy taught you how to start the car, son, but you can't drive the car on your own. Like seriously, my wife, she thought it wasn't a big deal to teach him how to like put his foot on the pedal and push the little button to turn the thing. On. It's like he wouldn't figure out that there was a, he could press the foot down and push that D button. So this is a true story. We were, we were, uh, we, we, we went for a beach day this summer we're sitting outside a cafe in Chilliwack near the lake. And my son, I put him in the back seat of our car. And I close the door and I walk and go to wake, make my way to the front door. And in the time it took me to close the door and make my way towards the front, at three years old, he jumped into the front seat, turned on the car, pressed D, and the car started to move forward while I'm standing beside the car. I like throw open the door. I grab my son. I throw my son against the passenger side window. I jump in. I hit the brakes. We didn't, I, I don't even know whether I should tell like, did this work out? Did people die? I should just leave the story right there. Everyone was okay. So, so far, but this is the kind of conversations I have with Wyland. I'm like, son, you're not supposed to hit your sisters and you're not supposed to drive the car. That's the content of the father-son conversations we have right now. In scripture here, with Jacob and his father Isaac, it's a little bit more serious. Isaac wants Jacob to know how much God wants to bless him. The beginning of verse or chapter 28 says, Isaac called Jacob uh, and blessed him and directed him. And they'll take a wife from the Canaanite woman, but watch this verse two, they'll put it on screen. Arise, go to Pat and Aaron. Arise, go to Pat and Aaron. So Isaac is saying, son, Jacob, God wants to bless you. But in order to receive the blessing, you've got to take a next step. You need to get up and take a next faith-filled step. The only thing that we see before Jacob gets the dream, which we're about to come to as we get down to verse 10, the only thing he did to receive the dream, watch this, was he was faithful to the last little thing his father gave him to do. But how many know that's not why we want a dream? You and I, we want a God dream because we don't want to have to be faithful to the last little thing God gave us to do. We want a God dream that actually gets us out of that dead end job, that gets us to a better place. We're like, I want a dream so I don't have to be faithful to the last servant-minded request that I got asked to do. But the way we actually acquire a God dream is to be faithful to the last little thing God gave us to do. What is there in your life that you need to be faithful in right now? I'm not talking about staying in the dead end job forever, but I am talking about in the season while you're in that place, while you're building towards what's next, walking in the door like you've got shares in the company and saying, I'm gonna roll in here with a great attitude. 
Oh, I might not be here forever. This might not be the thing that God has called me to, but I'm gonna be faithful in the season that I'm in. If we'll be faithful to the last little thing God gave us to do, I believe God then speaks to us in God's dreams. So here's the challenge question for us in this how to get a God dream. Come on, Rose Church, here it is. Are you able to follow? Are you able to follow? To follow the voice of the Holy Spirit, to follow godly leadership in your life, to come under the great vision that Pastors Mark and Roberta have for your church and to to run in that direction? Maybe it's difficult because you've been hurt before. Maybe you've had leaders hurt you. Maybe you've had people hurt you, parents hurt you. And so it's hard to follow in the little things that God says to do. In fact, the safest thing in your life has felt like I just do what I need to do for me. Part of the way God gives you a God dream and leads you into what's next for your life is that call to faithfulness, that call to surrender, that call that says, God, I will go where you lead. I'm able to follow. Over the Christmas break, Rach and I decided that we would take all three of our kids on individual one-to-one daddy-daughter dates and mummy-kid dates. So we had to, you know, when you get to three kids, if you got more than two kids, parents, you know, they actually have to get childcare for one of them so that then each parent can just be one-to-one and you can have that one-to-one time. Well, in my one-to-one time with my wild little while, and at the time he was three, I decided that I would take my boy on a father-son date to a bouldering gym. Like a bouldering gym is a climbing gym with no ropes. And my son was three. I, show, I didn't even know if three-year-olds could go bouldering, but I walked in with that, like that swagger, like you were here to boulder. You know what I'm saying? And so he walked in. I'm like, I, is he old enough to boulder? And they're like, if you think so, go for it. I'm like, I think, I think you'll be great. So we get little climbing shoes on him. And my boy, he's just ready to ascend the wall and go for it. He goes running over to the wall and he starts climbing right away. And I'm like, hold up, son. You can't climb the wall yet because before you can climb up, they've got to teach you how to fall. And so this young guy, maybe like 18 years old, his name was Ben. He came over and he said, okay, Wyland, before you can climb up this wall, I got to teach you how to fall. Because it's like 15 feet high that you can climb in this bowling gym. This is like, no one should be taking their three-year-old to this place. This is not a good idea. Should not be allowed. So I've got, I, I've got Ben there, and he says to Wyland, listen, before you can climb up this wall, I got to teach you to fall. And to fall down, you got to fall on your feet. There's like some padding that you fall to. It's not super soft, but soft enough, I guess. You fall on your feet, and then your bottom, and then your back. Because they don't want you falling on your hands, breaking your wrist, falling on your face. You got to go feet, bottom, back. I said, this is no problem. Okay, Wyland, here's what you got to do, son. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna stand there for a second, and then I just want you to go feet, bottom, back. Just fall back. And Wyland, three years old, he looks at me. Looks me square in the eyes. And he falls straight onto his face, onto his hands. <laughs> and Ben looks at me like, did your son not hear? Like, does he need an interpreter? Does your wife speak another language? Does he not know English? Like, what's happening? <laughs> I was like, no, man. Like, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know. I think Ben, I think Ben, we just need to demonstrate to him what he needs to do. So let's get up. We'll do it. So with one, on one side, Ben is there. On the other side, I'm standing there. Okay, Wyland, watch us. We're going to fall feet, bottom, back. And then you do it. So we fall backwards and we're like, I'm like, I know he's going to do it the second time. And then Wyan looks at me like, you seriously think I'm going to do this the second time? Falls straight onto his face and onto his hands. And Ben just looks at me and he's like, I can't let your son climb the walls. So we're like, you've got it. You need to leave the bouldering gym right now. And so we didn't get to climb that day. And here's the thing. Here's why this relates to the faith journey. It's the same in your faith life. There are heights that God has called you to climb to that you won't be able to climb until you're faithful to the last little thing God gave you to do. To that last little request, that last little, yes, God, I will go wholeheartedly. Come on, the move of God over Rose Church in 23. God already wants to do it, but it's contingent and dependent on hearts surrendered that say, yeah, God, we will go exactly where you call us to go with the right heart and the right spirit, with elevated expectations, but doing the last little thing you said to do. So if number one is why does a God dream matter? It's number one is because dreams revive. Number two, how do I get a God dream? Gotta be faithful to the last little thing God gave me to do. Brings us to this third thought, which is, well, how do I actually in the end know that my God dream is from God and it's not just me? So let's look at Jacob's dream here in verse 13 to 15. 
Jacob puts his head down. He has a dream, and this is what God says to him. I'm the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you're lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. And so here is the outline. I don't know if you noticed it as we read it, but there's an outline in here. God says, I will, you will, all peoples. I will, come on, say it with me. I will, you will, all peoples. Come on, one more time. I will, you will, all peoples. It's like when you were, you gotta like, we gotta line up our dreams against that format to see if it's from God. Like when you were in high school, you know, and, and you brought that note when you were away from school and they measured it up against the first note that your parents had written back on day one in grade nine, you know what I'm saying? Is this from your parents or did you hand write forge this thing? That's why kids, you've got to write the first note. If you're going into grade nine, this is a gift to you. Sign the first signature. How do I line up my dream and see if it's from God? God says, I will, you will, all peoples. Here's the first thing we need to test. I will means a God dream always requires God to be God. Like it's bigger than you could do on your own. If your dream is something you could accomplish on your own, it might be a dream, it's just not a God dream. I'm thankful for your pastors. I love, a couple months ago, they're sending me drawings that Mark has for the future and future buildings and things like, there's always vision flowing out of his life. I'm seeing these drawings. I'm like, I'm gonna steal and copy these. I'm just a Xerox, these things right here. It's beautiful. Requires God to be God. Second thing God says is, you will. We've talked a lot about this already. A God dream always asks something of you. A God dream is not something we sit back and wait for. A God dream always has a simple next step for us to do. Faithfulness, obedience, serving. I know I'm preaching to the choir on this. When I was in here this morning with your servant team rally, and my goodness, the culture of your church, I just love it. You serve here. So I'll talk... Was it, uh, was it Dylan this morning we met? And Dylan was like, he said, Pastor Mark, I just love it when I, when I come in here and there's nothing set up yet and we just get to make it happen. I'm like, I'm gonna steal this guy for Resonate Church. Dylan, there's a call to Vancouver. I will, you will. And then there's this last bit, all peoples. This is the key right here, all peoples, all peoples. How do you test and know if a vision and dream is from God? You're not the subject. How many know from a young age in Canada, we're taught to dream in self. We have game seven dreams. You know what I'm saying? How are the Jets doing this year? I don't really follow it. They're doing good. Better than Vancouver? Yeah. That's the kind of dreams we have. Like I'm gonna score the goal in game seven. I'm gonna Connor Bedard this thing. What's up? That's what we have to do in Vancouver. We got to cheer for Team Canada, not the Canucks. So often our dreams are in self. We got to line up the dream. Got to ask ourselves this question. If this dream came true, would it just change my life or would it change the lives of a whole bunch of other people? Had a business leader in our church come up to me in the month of December and say, Pastor, I want to get a meeting with you. And I was like, all right, let's make it happen. We were trying throughout December. It was too hard to find time to get together. December's busy. I said, why don't we do this? Why don't we make it the very first meeting of 2023? Put in our calendars for July 2nd. Meet up in the morning. You can share whatever God. He's like, God just put something on my heart. I want to share with you. He says, all right, let's make it the first meeting of the year. He's like, why don't you come meet me at my business? I'm starting a new business. Why don't you come meet me there? I'd love for you to pray over this place. I said, all right, let's go. So I meet him at his business. He's showing me what they want to do, like how they're going to tear down walls. He's got all this vision, all this money that they're going to, like hundreds of thousands of dollars that he's going to invest into revitalizing this organization. And this is what he does. He revitalizes companies. He's done it before. He'll do, this is the third time he will have done it with the same type of business. 
So he says, I already know what to do, so I already can see how God's going to bless it. I can't wait. It's already started to turn around since I took it over, and it won't be long until this is what we're going to see. So after he shows me the business, we go out, we sit down together over a meal, and he says to me, Pastor, he's like, this is what God told me. The first two businesses were for me and my family. This one's only for Jesus. He said, I want to commit to you that every ounce of profit that comes out of this business, we're going to turn around and sow into the kingdom through Resonate Church. He said, I'm believing in year number one, I'm believing for $250,000 to invest into the dreams that God has given to you for Resonate Church. Can I ask you the question, if your God dream came true, if the dream of your life came true, would it impact you or would it impact a whole bunch of other people? As he's telling me this, tears are coming down his cheeks like God has just put the, it's been birthed in the spirit. That's how you know. He's just like, he's thinking about social justice. He's thinking about missions. He's thinking about people coming to Jesus. He's just crying. All peoples. One more story and then we're going to pray. On this call to all peoples, it was, it was a while back when I got a phone call from my wife, Rachel. She said, babe, did, did our daughter get an invitation to her friend's party? I said, honey, no, I, don't, I never got an invitation to that party. And she said, here's why I'm asking. Because the parents of this girl in her class just showed up after school today and gave out party favors to absolutely everybody in the class, but, but our daughter didn't get one. There's not that many girls in her class. And so we actually could see that every other girl in the class had been to the birthday party and got a party favor in front of my daughter. You gotta understand, I was ready to be that dad in that moment. Come on dads, you know what I'm saying? I was like, I know where they live. I'm on my way. We're just gonna have a little talk about birthday parties, party favors, and how it should go down. We're gonna have a little chat. I was like, I'm gonna have to be that parent. And then Rachel started talking and I realized I'm gonna have to be the stable parent because she's not talking about driving over to their house to talk. She's going over there to murder people. You understand? I'm like, babe, I, I think you need to settle down. As I hung up that phone, I'm sitting in my office. I just slunched, slouched down into my chair and I'm like, I'm devastated for my baby girl. Oh man, why, she, why is she not, why is my girl got a feel on her own? Why is she not getting an invite to the party? And as I'm literally melting into my office chair, as I'm sad for my baby girl, the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, Shane, this is the way I feel all the time. Because I got a son on your street that doesn't know me yet. I got a daughter just lives down the street from you. She doesn't have an invitation to the party yet. Rose Church, we do not exist to throw services or parties for ourselves. We exist to make sure that everybody gets an invitation to the party. We dream not in self, we dream not for us. We dream so that all God's sons and daughters, the ones that look like us right now and the ones that look nothing like us right now, the ones that we would typically pass by and not think of, we exist so that they get an invitation to the party. I'm calling you today to elevate your expectations again in 2023. I'm calling us today to begin to close our eyes and dream of a vision of the future. Come on all over the room, would you stand with me? And I'm inviting us to just begin to allow the Holy Spirit to spark dreams and vision and future, not for us, but for all peoples. God, I pray, Lord, over your church today. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you've promised to pour your spirit out upon all flesh. You've promised to give us prophetic vision. You've promised to give us dreams. And I'm praying today, there's this people in the room today, and you used to dream, you used to see it, but you lowered your expectations because things got tough. And today, God's in the room today to say, it's time to dream again, it's time to dream again, it's time to dream again. Some of you are saying, I'm too old. That's why God said in Joel, you're old men, you're old women. They're gonna be the ones to dream dreams. It's not too late for you. It's not too late to be a part of the next move of God. It's not too late to be a part of what God wants to do in and through your life. It's time to dream again. Some of you, you're going to begin to just see faces of people on your street. That This is the year that God's going to press their lives on your heart. Yes, God, we look past ourselves. 
Lord, this room does not exist for us. We thank you that you're changing our lives here. But God, we exist to make this room remarkable so that your kids can hear how much you love them. I believe there's business leaders in the room today. And you heard that story about the guy who said all that profit from that business is going to go to the kingdom. And God is challenging the fire out of you today because so far everything that you've ever built has been all about you. And today, with lots of challenge but immense amounts of love, God is calling your heart and saying, it's time to build my kingdom.